This week, boy meets wolf girl. That's right. For the very first time ever, I watched Princess Mononoke. What is up, everybody? Jake Baker here with another episode of Clear Tinted Classics, the show where I, your host, Jake Baker, I said that already, watch classic movies for the very first time ever and give my nostalgia-free opinions on them. That's right. I did actually remember it. It's been a long time since I've recorded an episode. Not that you'll know if I ever release these. These will probably be close together. Anyway, today's a very special episode because today I'm joined by two guests. That's right. And they're in the room with me, actually, which is maybe... I shouldn't say that since right now, as no, you know, what, I'm not going to date this podcast. On my right is my friend Mike SB. Mike, say hi. Hi, Jake. How are you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you? I'm swell, man. I'm really good. Really good. I'm excited to talk about uh, about this movie, to say the least. I really am. <laughs> All right. And on my left is the girl who's only known as Lily. Say hello. Well, hello there. I apologize in advance since this is my first podcast, so do not judge me too harshly. Don't worry. It seems like every podcast is my first podcast. Um, but oh my yeah, God. We have a girl on the podcast? They're... There's a girl on the podcast? She's got an accent. Does she have an accent? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Hey, don't reveal my stuff. I just said accent. Shh, that's more than enough. Oh, okay. She's French. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Oui, oui. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's right. This week we're going to talk about, or I don't know why I say this week, we're going to talk about the movie Princess Mononoke. And uh, I'm excited because this was actually a really out of left field. We didn't even know what we were going to watch. And then uh, Espy, as I call him, uh, he just suggested it. And apparently that suggestion actually came from Lily, who says it's one of her favorite movies of all time. So first off, uh, I would like to know a little bit more about both of you guys. So Lily, this is one of your favorite movies, or how's it rank up there for you? Uh, well, yeah, I, I do believe it's one of my favorites. Um, for myself, I think it's up 9.5, if not 10. But then again, you know. Are you a big animation fan, or is this just kind of an outlier for you? Well, I would say that I am a fan of animation, but I I know those hardcore animation fans are going to say that I'm not because I don't go into the whole details of who is the writer and who is this and that. I just watch him, and if I like him, I like him. Yeah, and you said that I asked you before what your familiarity with Miyazaki was, and you said you had seen Spirited Away, right? Or No, you, no, you hadn't seen Spirited Away, but you'd seen... Which one had you seen? Did did we find out? Um, the um, um, Kiki's delivery. Kiki's delivery service, right? And uh, how's that stack up for you? Like, do you like that one too? Or I do. I do like that one. I enjoy it. I don't know if I can consider it one of my favorite ones, though. Are you a big Disney fan? Yes. Okay. Now, what are some of your favorite Disney movies? Well, The Lion King. Okay. Um, what do you think of the remake? Have you seen the remake? <laughs> I have not seen the remake only because I have heard that it would ruin my childhood. Oh. <laughs> so. Oh, you don't want to see National Geographic's Lion King? No, no. Directed no. by the guy that made Swingers? Oh, yeah. That, that sounds very appealing right now. I, maybe Lion, I Lion will King, go. Lion King's a really solid pick. I mean, that was... That that's pantheon of Disney type stuff. Um, I grew up on The Little Mermaid was actually one of my favorites. Um, but Lion King's real solid. The the Fox Robin Hood movie was actually a favorite of mine. How do you feel about some of the more modern, like Fro? You seen Frozen, Moana? I've seen Frozen. Um, and I know that they. Some people say that it's more like a strong female role, but actually, I think that um, one of the stronger roles started with like. Mulan. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, you're not wrong. Yeah. I don't. I, I would not disagree with that. Mulan's. At all. I, I don't know. For some reason, sometimes Mulan tonally, it's almost it's so serious, um, and the music's like. It's few, very. It, it's very. Ju- it's there's a, quite a juxtaposition between. I, the I sometimes actual, forget to include it in my Disney list off the top of my yeah. head. It's because like I, I think after the song where they sing about the girls which girl they want and they find that camp that's been laid to waste mm-hmm. i don't think there's another song in the rest of the movie that's really like 
I, you know, now that you mention it, I don't think so. Yeah, it's like really crazy. Like I, I, I never noticed it until someone pointed it out, and I was like, yeah, I guess the music just ends. But yeah, <laughs> the Milan's great. How about you, Espy? What's your animation, Miyazaki, films in general? Tell people a little bit about how much of a film buff you are. Oh, man. Well, you know that I actually work on short films. I've worked on your feature as well, my friend. Um, but also, when it comes to films uh i would say that in terms of animation my first introduction to um Hayao Miyazaki was Spirited Away okay and in comparison to like Disney animation or in even at the time 3D and computer animation Hayao Miyazaki um struck a chord with me it was one of those movies when i watched for the first time it didn't it didn't really settle in like what i just watched because it, like at the time it was like i knew i liked it but i go I don't quite understand why I really liked it, but it still felt euphoric. It felt magical. And I feel like any time when I, when I do watch that movie in particular, because I have not seen Kiki's Delivery Series, Howl's Moving Castle, My Neighbor Totoro, um, Ponyo. Like there's a lot of films on my list that I have not seen or in just other animes in, in general that I really want to see. Um, I just haven't gotten there. When when do when did you first see Spirited Away? It was around two thousand four, two thousand five. Okay, Give the, it, it, that area because I could not, I can't remember if I was in high school or just got out of high school around that time when I actually. Even at that age, it still affected you like that. Yeah, and well, well, the thing was the reason why it had a, such a huge impact. Um, it was because I was going to school for computer animation. That was my main degree. Now I don't do that now but ever since ever throughout high school that was like i knew that i wanted to do computer animation dead set that's all i wanted to do and then went through college uh, a bit of change of heart that's the long short of it (laughs) um but now i'm more so behind the camera uh if there's ever films that i do enjoy on a regular basis i'm i'm starting trying to get more into south korean films now a lot more Asian. You can just say Korean. We know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and no offense, but if you, there's nothing that comes out of North Korea, guys. <laughs> well, there are some things that they have their own special film propaganda, but yeah, no, I know it's 100%. propaganda. Yeah, it's, it's, South, South Korean movies are, they've been a bit of a new discovery for me as well, and they're just so fantastic. I, 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 I was I was talking a little earlier about this that I feel like. If I were to see a South Korean movie made here in a Western market, I feel like I would not have had the same like impact on it. Like I just feel like they just don't have any boundaries. They just don't. Huh. The level of imagination or the magnitude that they um, execute with their product, or the, when I say product, their films, it, it's just like they just go for it. They just don't have any. They just it just doesn't feel like they care, but they do at the same time. They're just like this is what it's going to be. And you don't have to like it or not. That's kind of the impression I get. Um, and I think it's relevant to today's movie as well. A, a lot of countries, they treat film like it's art, mm-hmm. and they have funding in place to fund that art. It's, yeah. not, it's not as commercialized. It's not as much of in a capitalist system. So a lot of South Korean movies, a lot of foreign films in general, French movies, mm-hmm. you get these auteurs who get to just have their vision that's funded like by the government right. sometimes even in Canada it's like that as long as you have like a mostly Canadian crew the Canada film board will toss you thousands of dollars to make movies right. but it's just not like that in America no, no 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 but that means you get to see more out there stuff and i i didn't really do a lot of research on what the japanese film industry is like obviously japan more than maybe any other country has this heavy emphasis on animation and a heavy respect for it. Right. And you know, it's where anime comes from. But I mean, I'm not going to go too far down this rabbit hole, but uh, Miyazaki and his weird hate boner for anime uh, is this whole can of worms. I'm not super interested in opening up in terms of this discussion, but Mm -hmm. it's very interesting the way he talks about anime today when he essentially is one of the godfathers of how we got to where we're at today. Yeah. Um, but he just, he doesn't like the way that it's expressive and the way it's drawn today, but that's neither here nor there. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard, uh, I've heard comments like that and, and his, his method, if I remember correctly, the way he creates films is that he just, 
he doesn't really do the traditional he doesn't do the the, the, the traditional form of like filmmaking where you, you go through this whole pre-production you know you write a treatment you write your story you write your screenplay you do your storyboard and you, know, you have your cast you know you know all that car- all that sort of stuff from what I remember he just draws uh-huh. he just just draws until he gets something on the paper and he's like oh this is what it's gonna be this is I know what I want now and it's like you spend all this time drawing and it's like it's like the opposite of what I was taught to do. And, sure. it, and, and, and for me, it, it goes against the very nature of how I operate as someone who makes films, who helps create that sort of product. As far as Princess Mononoke goes, what is your, this is, this isn't the first time you've watched it. It's not the first time, but it certainly feels like the first time because, um, I cannot recall the very nature of when I saw it, but I remember seeing because I when I was watching the movie today, I was like, "Oh yeah, I remember this," but I don't remember. <laughs> it's one of those weird feelings, like I remember seeing this, uh, but when? But but so I just I stopped focusing on that and just just go, okay, you know, I'm here now. This is my first time, whatever. But uh, watching it for the first second time, it was again another the thing about. Studio Ghibli films is that um, I can only just say from Spirit Away, but it still feels like I'm I am taking out of we, this. We've all seen like clips from the other movies, though. It's right, like, and maybe the, you haven't watched My Neighbor Totoro, but you you know what the guy looks like. A lot of people have seen when he turns into a bus, yes, and drives around. Like yeah, and I've <laughs> seen images of Ponyo. I've seen images and clips of Kiki's Delivery Service. So I'm not oblivious, but I feel like. To a sense, when it comes to Studio Ghibli films, you are taken to another location. Like I don't feel like um, I'm here in this world. Like I am in, like I am engrossed in mm-hmm. that environment, that world. So within like the first five to ten minutes of this film, I just remember thinking, "I go, well, I'm not going to look away. <laughs> I'm not going to look at my phone right now because this is already. I have no idea exactly what's going on. I know." what's happening plot wise, but I'm not sure why it's happening, but I know this is bad right now. I know this is, I know this is good, but I don't know the full story, but I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get to the full story because it's the very beginning of the film right now. Yeah. But but that's the thing. It it gives you somehow he gives you nuggets, 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 nuggets. Something I think we will talk about with this movie is that the structure of the plot and the progression of it is, hard to predict in a way that both is really interesting, but also can confuse you at times because the, the movie zigs and zags in certain ways that I just didn't see coming in. I guess for the record, I said at the top of the podcast, I'd never seen this movie ever. And I didn't ask Lily, like, do you remember maybe when you first watched it or at least maybe how many times you've seen it? Do you think? Oh gosh. Um, I cannot recall the first time that I watched it, but it's got to be at least 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah, I believe the film is 23 years old, the Japanese version. Came out in 97? 97, the Japanese version did. 99 for the English dub. Okay. When Miramax acquired it, which there's that's a whole other... Never mind that. Uh, <laughs> you, you went down that rabbit hole, didn't you, bud? Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't talk about Miramax anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, no. The, movie, the, movie's, the movie's got some age on it. Um, I, I want to yeah, talk about... Technically, one of the only segments, or actually, I forgot to tell you guys, there is a segment that I do. I'm going to do this really quick. I generally will summarize the movie yeah. for the listener, but I always preface it with this. I'm going to do a bad job summarizing this movie. And also, if you're listening to this episode and you haven't seen the movie, you're going to be very confused. And also, I'm going to spoil the shit out of the movie. So just... Yeah, it, 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 this is not spoiler free. But this is for the, the crazy yeah. people who are... Like I, either listening for me, which I don't think they would, or maybe they're listening for you guys. They're fans, and they're like, "What the hell is this show? I just want to hear SB and Lily talk." Here's my. <laughs> I don't think brief, they want to do that. Here's, but. <laughs> here's here's my brief summary of Princess Mononoke. Go for it. I um, hear it. The movie starts off. There's a young boy named Ashitaka. Uh, he's from this small village. The village is attacked by this boar who's been possessed by a demon god, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the distinction between demons and demon gods are. They don't really get into that. Um, No, they don't. He fights off the boar, but in the process, he is touched by the demon. His right arm gets cursed by the demon. The village is like, you got to go on a journey 
to figure this shit out. You're going to die. And also you can't be any here anymore. So he leaves, he goes through a forest. He meets a guy with a red nose who becomes important later. He stumbles across the village, which I think is just called iron village. doesn't really have like a specific name. Um, he meets this woman, lady Eboshi, who basically founded the village from the ground up. They dug up all the iron. They made all these guns. They're kind of at war with the forest. Um, and so, this kid, Ashitaka, stumbles into sort of this ongoing war between the forest spirits and the town. And he kind of falls right in the middle of it. He's there to try to find the forest spirit so that maybe he can get his arm healed. But now he's being drawn into this conflict. He sees the titular Princess Mononoke, who is called San, I believe, in yeah, this San. movie. And he, you can kind of tell from his first glance where literally her introduction in this movie is she's sucking blood out of a wolf's wound, which is a hell of an introduction. I loved it. You can kind of tell really early on he's at least interested in her, if not smitten. But, you know, there's the movie's two hours and 13 minutes long. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. It's all very dense. But the long and short of it is he gets drawn into this conflict. The town goes to war with the, with the forest. The forest tries to fight back. He tries to find a way to make peace. But eventually they end up killing the forest god. Everything goes to shit until at the very end they save the day. And they all decide they're going to live happily ever after. Yeah. Uh, and... It all wraps up a little too quickly for my taste, but that's that's okay. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> I, I will. I, I we'll get to that. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's the basic summary of the movie. Um, and the other segment that I do do is my preconceived notions, where I talk about what did I know about this movie going in. Okay, and I'll do mine first because they're really short. Okay, I knew it was a Miyazaki movie, and I, I I do know enough about Miyazaki that I know the baggage that that entails. But for the for the record, I've only ever seen my neighbor my neighbor Totoro. I've not seen any other Miyazaki films. I've not seen Spirited Away, even though they played it on Cartoon Network like ad nauseum when I was a kid. I just never caught it. Um, I haven't seen Howl's Moving Castle. I haven't seen that Lupin movie that he did. Uh, this is my second Miyazaki film. And I, I didn't know what the plot of this movie was at all. Like gen- generally with like moderately famous movies, you kind of have a gist of like what the story is, but I didn't know anything. I about mean, this if movie. you hear about, for example, star Wars and specifically like the original trilogy, you, even though you may have never seen a star Wars film, you could probably get a good idea what those movies yeah, are about. I talk, I talk about like the Godfather, yeah. like going into that. I'm like, yeah, it's about this family and there's crime and blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm like, I think this is a fantasy movie, but the only thing I've ever associated with this movie is the picture of San with the wolf pelt on her head. So I just knew there was a girl with a wolf head. I assumed she was the main character. She's kind of not. Ashitaka is actually the main character. Which is which what I... Um, I, Which is actually a little against the grain too for Miyazaki because he generally has female protagonists yes, he for does. his films. His films actually have a feminist bent to them, which is a really interesting angle, especially for like an older male Japanese director. Yeah, um, he, he generally his movies star women. Kiki's Delivery Service, Spirited Away, um, mm-hmm. and obviously San is a very important. You know, to go against that, like even though Ashitaka serves as the main character, you have two very strong female characters in San and Lady Eboshi, yeah, and then San's mother wolf. So you know, he's still he's still hitting his check marks on, on as far yeah, as that he goes. Is. And I, I see, um, I, I see the character as more of like the like is more of like uh, as a vessel for us. Well, it, it's it's funny because I kept making this reference in my head, even though this is another movie I have not seen, mm-hmm. but I know the gist of what Yojimbo is about because Yojimbo is a story that has been retold a million times. It's a story about a samurai wanders into a town where two factions are fighting each other. This guy wanders into town, plays them against each other. It's a little more selfish, but this has got elements of that. This Wanderer wanders into this conflict and finds himself drawn in between these two warring factions. It's kind of a story that's been told over and over again. I didn't know that that's what this story was about. Miyazaki generally has like environmentalism and fantasy mm-hmm. woven into his stories, but like I didn't expect talking wolves and boars. I and I, I, I did sh- not either. I, sh- I sure, I'll, and I'll get to it. I did not expect the level of violence that is in this oh, movie. Oh man, that's uh, the best part. <laughs> that was shocking because the, the first time it really happened, like he shoots 
shoots the boar in the eye, but you're like, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't it's not graphic. It's not as graphic. But no. the first thing that really happens is he shoots a guy's fucking arm off <laughs> out of nowhere. And it's so graphic and out of nowhere that I, I yelped out loud. I was like, what the fuck? Like what, what just happened? Like, uh, but that's as far as it goes. I, I it had that uh, reminiscence of a little bit of like a Akira for me. Like, cause I remember when I see when I've seen when I when I watched Akira a long time ago, I just couldn't get over like the the level of violence in this movie. I was like, man, this is really graphic, and I was like, holy smokes! But the thing what really caught me the most because well, I, yeah, I associate just, when it's I this twofold thing where a lot of people associate animation as for children, yes, which is something that which I rail against not. all the time. I hate that. Like, I hate that just because something's animated, people think that it's not for adults. And two. I do. I also do associate Studio Ghibli with Cuddly Totoro or yeah. Spirited Away, a little girl on an adventure. But a lot of people that have seen Spirited Away will tell you it's the stuff of nightmares. See, um, but that's the best thing about it, though, because me being a person that started watching anime since I was young, it was great that my parents thought that it was for children. <laughs> Because otherwise, they would not have let me see it. That's so. a good point. Like, it's probably why a lot of people have memories of Spirited Away because people are like, oh, it's a cartoon. We can show our kids. And it's like, uh, but the they, Studio Ghibli films, like Totoro is the only other movie I've seen. It is the main characters are children, but they're dealing with the loss of their mother, if I'm remembering correctly. And there's a lot of deep stuff about grief and loss. And it, it is still a very adult story. Like, there's this weird distinction of movies. There's some movies that star children that are for children, but I, there's a lot of movies that, even though a child is the main protagonist, they're still more aimed at an adult crowd. Like it's more of remember what it was like when you were a child. It's like you watch like a movie like mid '90s or whatever. It's like remember what it was like being a kid in the '90s and stuff yeah. like that. It's not that that movie's not for children. How, how many movies starring children have you seen that have? F bombs in them actually are like actually oh. are R rated. Let's you guys, you want to talk about Pan's Labyrinth? We want you want to get into that right now. <laughs> That's a movie I will do for this podcast eventually. I've also not seen that. Oh wow! Um, but I know okay. the whole premise of this podcast is I've not seen a lot of these movies, and it's it the depth the depth of of what this goes to of the movies that I've missed out on is truly awful. I'd be but, curious to hear what you think of Pan's Labyrinth because that's one of my favorites, man. Um, as far as preconceived notions for you, SB, what did you know? You, you technically had seen it, but you didn't remember it. Like I, I'm just going to say, I just to be fair, I don't, re- I just don't remember much. I much like you. I remember the cover image um, the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the disc case. Like to, that to me, when I hear, when I hear Princess Mononoke, I see that image of the shelf case on the, of the image of the case, the DVD cover. And so for me, it's like, Oh, I remember the image. Like it's like to me. So I guess it says something about the movie, a movie that I didn't remember much about anything at all, if anything, but yet you could tell me Princess Mononoke. I go, Oh yeah, that's the girl with the wolf. You know, yeah, and the, and that's the, a good point. And I'm like, and that, to me, I go, maybe that's a good Testament that how, how like a character design at least because imagery like to me Mm -hmm. this is all filled with imagery and obviously because it's animation dear joke bad joke um but (laughs) visually it's one of those movies where i go i'm a i walked away from it i go i'm gonna remember this for a very long time and and, and not because necessarily because uh, of the story but how it was how the story was told through its visual elements Uh like to me yes that story We've all heard this scene. We've all heard and seen the same stories numerous times. But again, I, it is a testament how how presentation goes. And mm-hmm. for me, the presentation of that story about a wanderer coming into between two fact, two factions, going at it with one another. Like I'm like, yeah, I know that's the story. But at the same time, I go, hmm. I still want. I'm still going to watch it because how what the elements that are involved are the most interesting aspects and in how. I want to see how these characters play out. And I go, I like the character I'm with right now. He seems like a good dude right now. So we'll see how it plays out. And side note, that whole black goo that was absorbing his body kind of reminded me of Shadow of the Colossus a little bit. Okay. And a game that came out in originally on the PlayStation 2, um, 2005, got remastered, and I put that in quotation marks, in 2011, then officially got a good facelift and a good buff in terms of controls in 2017, 2018. And the character goes on this, his, his name is Wanderer, believe it or not. <laughs> and you face off like 16 Colossi and these 
class that you defeat released like this black goo, which oh. helped make you stronger. So when I when I started thinking about that, I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Oh, I'm sure there's like the, I'm it, sure the influence of Miyazaki can be felt like across all sorts of things. Like I mean, it's Team Japan, and so it would not it would not. I mean, if they said people. if they said they got like some influence from this movie, I'd be like, okay, I, you, you sold me. Like I, I, I can see it. Um, Sorry for that tangent. Lily was, doesn't get a preconceived notion section because she's already seen the movie, but uh, so that's cheating. But <laughs> um, I, I do uh, want to ask: Did both of you watch the English dub? I did. I I watched the English dub. Okay, just for uh, just for clarity's sake, I watched the English sub. Because subs over dubs. Uh, That's how I feel in general. <laughs> but uh, so I, I watched the English dub version um, just out of curiosity because I am, I'm always curious about, even though I'm like you, Jake, I'm subs over dubs. <laughs> I, I really like, like that phrase right now. Uh, I do like hearing where the origin of the film came from because I prefer to hear the Japanese voice actors and then read the English, read the English subtitles. It, Cause to me, I think that probably would have made my experience a little bit better because, uh, one of the English voice actors, I don't know if I would consider him a voice actor, but he is a voice <laughs> actor in this movie. Um, <laughs> Billy Bob Thornton. I'm just going to throw out a movie that maybe people may be familiar with him is bad Santa. He played the <laughs> drunken Santa Claus. So you may be familiar with, I'm going to throw that one out because that seems like the most easily recognizable movie off the top of my head for some reason. Bad News Bears, Sling Blade. Uh, French Fried Gators. French Fried Gators. That wasn't the voice he was doing for this. But. No, 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 no. <laughs> In fact, um, one of the things, he plays the character... Very infamously dated Angelina Jolie for a while and had a vial of her blood around his neck. Oh. This is okay. this is real. This is true. This is not a joke. It's true. Well, all right. But um, vampires s- exist. <laughs> uh, so the reason why I bring that up because I found him to be very distracting because nothing about his performance with the character Jigo really is like it's all very flat. It was just all very flat, and the way of character of the design of Jigo, I kept thinking. I, I kept watching. I go. This doesn't match his voice. Not like the mouth flaps, but the way the character's designed, and then I go, and I'm hearing the voice, and I go, this doesn't match at all. This is like, this doesn't <laughs> feel right. And I'm not saying the character has to be stereotyped, but there's got to be a certain quality to your voice when you do performance that really somehow captures the essence of that character. So when I saw the character of Jigo, and I heard Burly Bob Thornton, coming out of his mouth and I go, no, <laughs> that's all I just said. I was like, no. Yeah. And so that, and unfortunately when I listened, when I watched the dub version, I just kept thinking, this is not good. This is not good. Like this, it's not, it's not terrible. It's not terrible. It's just, it's not appropriate in the sense of like, it just does, it doesn't feel like it fits the character. Uh, and I, then I you clicked. showed, and then you showed me a clip of the Japanese version with the English sub, with the English subtitle and when I heard that character and I saw the character, I go, oh, that fits. That works. That somehow the tonality of that character design does not match the tonality of Billy Bob Thornton's voice. Or just, I shouldn't just, should just say his voice, but the performance that he was given. It was just monotone. It was flat. It just, just I, clicked, I clicked through the English dub just to get a sense of it. I think everybody else was pretty spot on. Billy Crudup did a good job as the main guy. Yep. Claire Danes was doing good as son. Um, yeah. Uh, Keith David is magnificent as the boar. Like, like it seemed like Billy Bob Thornton was the, maybe the one big swing and a miss for that character. But it's, it, you're right though. Like the way a character is designed, you do kind of expect them to sound a certain way. And if they don't meet that expectation, it's confusing. Like, even if you don't realize it just subconsciously, you're like, what is wrong here? But like mini, mini driver, I think was Iboshi. Mm-hmm. She's great. I just watched Tarzan recently and she's Jane in that. Um, and yeah. I mean, in, in for some reason, uh, lady Iboshi is kind of British sounding too. I guess it, the thing that's tough with me sometimes is, is uh, to Japanese voices. Like I'll see stuff that's like, Oh, this character's speaking with a dialect, but because I'm not so, I'm not familiar with the language at all. I don't pick up when certain characters talk a certain way that if you were a native speaker, mm-hmm. like 
the movie I'm going to recommend at the end of this podcast, there's a part where one of the characters is talking like someone who's from a rural area. Yeah. But I didn't know that they were doing that until it was pointed out by another character. I didn't pick up on that at all. So it's like, I don't know, if maybe Lady Eboshi was speaking more proper. What, what's kind of weird, though, is I checked out the Japanese voice actors to see what else they'd done, and their credits are not, there's not a lot. Like the guy that played uh, uh, Ashitaka, he did like two other movies and they were like, there was like years between them too. So I don't may, although now that I'm saying that out loud, it's occurring to me that maybe they were like, I guess I'm so used to in Japanese animation voice actors being so prolific. Yeah. Maybe back then in, in 97, I didn't actually check to see whether these actors were in movies. Right. I just checked their voice acting credits. So maybe they're like actor actors or not that voice actors aren't actors. I think voice actors are incredibly underrated as a, as a profession. I mean, uh, and honestly, while I'm on the, while we're on this subject, I'm going to take this opportunity to rail against this new trend of picking people that are famous to be in animated movies. Let's put Zac Efron as, as the character in our trolls movie or whatever fucking movie he's in. I don't remember, <laughs> but it's like no child cares that Zac Efron is in this movie. Right. Like, just get a good voice actor. No, nobody cares. Like, I mean, you, you have to, and also you're, what you're, what you're pointing out is the demographic. Like you just don't, we're gonna have Mike Myers and um, Cameron Diaz, and it's like you know what? I don't care if it's Mike Myers. I, but I do, do want to say like, like, but it doesn't mean that some yeah. actors can't do good voice work. Right, right. Alan Tudyk, great voice actor, but also just a great actor in general, a screen actor. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that Kristen Bell. Yeah, um, I think she she's does a Frozen. great job in the Frozen movies. Yeah, she's excellent. Those are exceptions, but sometimes whenever they'll cast like, why is Christopher Walken voicing somebody in this movie that doesn't? Who is that for? Your nine year old does not care that Christopher Walken. I, I don't know if Christopher Walken's ever done a voice in something, but uh, he was the um, king. Wasn't he King Louie in the Jungle Book movie? Oh yeah, in the remake, do. he was. I want to be like you. Yeah, I do love that though. <laughs> Uh, great, uh, great dancer, Christopher Walken. Um, <laughs> but yeah, let's 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 shift gears and let's start talking about the movie. I, I have notes here of some of the stuff that happened in it. So as I said, the movie starts off. We meet Ashitaka, mm-hmm. um, and I, I actually found him endearing kind of immediately. Obviously, the first thing you see when the movie starts is, oh shit, the animation's gorgeous, the right. landscapes look yeah, great, definitely. Yeah. Um, but the character designs are very Ghibli. Uh, the Ghibli characters tend to look very similar. I, I did get a chuckle. He he meets like these three girls that look straight out of Kiki's delivery service right off the bat. Right, yeah, yeah. All their faces look the same. Yeah. And a lot of the women in Iron Town look samey. Yeah, yeah um, they, pretty much. They have pretty- to the point where I was like, oh, is that the one? Okay, yeah, she's being kind of sassy. So I think that's, that's the, the one that's being sassy. But like, <laughs> Um, I kind of I liked him immediately for some reason. Like I loved his little deer, Yakul. Um, his elk, yeah, his elk, yeah, his, his elk, was his pretty red elk. elk with the horns and the mm-hmm. whatever. And it just it, the movie wastes no time. Like for a movie that's over two hours long, it's just like something's fucked up. What is it? And then this giant dark spaghetti monster like bursts <laughs> out of the forest, and they're like, "Holy shit!" And then he just he just goes down there and and. Right off the bat, you see who he is as a character because instead of just attacking immediately, he's like, calm down. We don't want to harm you. He's just like trying to talk this monster down and he, until the, he doesn't want to hurt it until the very last possible second when he's forced to to prevent it from charging into the village. It's a great character introduction, I think. Mm-hmm. That's that, that, that's a, it's an example. It's a prime example of show don't tell. So you're getting exposition. Whether you, I, I think what people... F- are afraid of when it comes to exposition, especially in writing when you, I'm trying to do something on my own and exposition. It's like, how do I do this without being boring? So like, how do you do, how do you do that? Like, and that's like, it's one of the toughest things when you sit down and try to type or write something out and you're like, this can't be boring because if it is, uh, uh, no, that's going to be a no right away. But with this, like, like you've said that you, he's his first, his first action is to alert the townsfolk. Just alert them. The big, stay calm. Try to beat you in. And really, his last action was to like, okay, I try to be peaceful, and you're not. You're not doing it at he, all. He's he's a rare example of a, of a protagonist who is kind of actually a static character. Mm-hmm. Um, and by that, I mean when it comes to characters, you have either static characters or dynamic characters. And generally your protagonist will be a dynamic character who goes through changes throughout the movie. And while he does 
a little bit in this movie. He doesn't, he kind of starts and ends up in the same place. He's tries to go for peace first. He's a very noble guy and he ends the movie still being him doing that. And like, so, and he, <laughs> but I think because the reason why this works, because you had two different factions um, that are dynamic. Yes. In the way they work. You, you can't have all static characters. No, no. Like, so that's, and I think that's why it works because you want to be in, in type of any type of fantasy adventure movie. You obviously you want your character to go from point A to point B, but given the scenario that has taken place, and of course, having like the Yojimbo um, storyline, as you mentioned, that static character trying to be the mediator between these two factions, I, I go, this works. I know, like, I understand like the, the rules for like a fantasy adventure with a character going on a journey and so on and so forth. But this, because of we have these two really polar opposites happening, we may actually need a constant to take us on mm-hmm. this journey yeah. to really echo and to really spread that good nature around and try to, to settle this. And that's why I really like that character a lot because of the predicament he found himself in. Yeah. How about you, Lily? How do you feel about Ashitaka? Oh, well, like you were saying, you know, the introduction is pretty much like this is a noble guy. And the, the most interesting thing for myself, like you said, this monster comes in and golf on this spaghetti like thing <laughs> and then as you uh continue to watch the movie you you kind of understand what that was and it's i don't know it, it was really interesting to me because that gooey stuff is actually supposed to be like a representation of anger you allowing anger to take over you mm-hmm. so being this noble guy and having this trouble of fighting this curse that is pretty much saying i'm gonna take the worst out of you how are you how are you gonna handle that yeah and i think it's it's part of why if he wasn't so strong and like clear-headed i feel like the movie sort of hints that if he was prone to anger and hate the curse would have taken him over a lot faster but it's very right. slow because he's he's fighting he's able he's calm he's he's values peace he and in the moments where the curse does grow a little bit it's when we see those flashes of his anger when he stops the fight between san and eboshi which we'll get to or when he uses the power to push or even when he first kills those samurai when he's first after he's left town or whatever but it's really it's like to keep going with this character though the next thing we see is they meet with the oracle of the town she rolls some bones and some stones and she's like <laughs> uh so bad news you're fucked. You're going to die. Um, she has all. a bullshit around yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, she's like, she's like, I remember watching that part and I, and I, I, sh- I shouldn't have chuckled, but I kind of <laughs> liked her bluntness of this. She didn't say those exact words, but she's, she very politely just addressed him like, yeah, you're, you're just going to die. You're, like, <laughs> you're going to die. I'm like, you're done, son. But, like, it's like the, but you immediately get the understanding that like, and she's looking at the kid and the kid's just like, just tell me. And she's like, you're going to die. And he's just like, I figured, but I had to do what I had to do. And and again, another more points to him. The way he took it, he was just so like, you know what? He literally says, I think, I knew what was going to happen when mm-hmm. I had to take the board down. Right. But I had to take the board down. I did what I had to do. And you're just like, this guy's a fucking stud. Like, I love this guy. And then the, the townsfolk are su- super upset. They're like, why? why? And she's like, you got to leave. You got to cut off your ponytail and get the hell out. If you go west, though, maybe you can figure something out. And he's just like, well, guess I'm going to west. And he just gets his shit and he gets on his horse, deer, elk and goes to ride off. His sister comes out for a brief moment and gives him this uh, jeweled dagger that he wears as a necklace, which kind of becomes somewhat important later in the movie, which it's very, very Chekhov's gun type situation where it's like, I want you to have my special jeweled dagger here. Close up of the dagger. This won't be important later. I'll always <laughs> keep it safe. I was like, okay, yeah, well, we'll see what happens when that comes into play later. But yeah, I was just like, I'm surprised at how quickly the movie just gets into it. It's like, and, and and they they don't spend a lot of time with the town, but just based off these two interactions, you get that this town is very like traditional, very spiritual. There's a lot of rules. Like they're they're basically like nobody. There's a little like throwaway line like nobody can watch you leave, which is like just this interesting flavor that they add to it. It's just like it's like you've been outcast. You have to leave. You're possessed by a demon. You got to go. And he's just because like, like when his sister runs out, he's like you can't see. And they're kind of like whatever, I wanted to give you the thing. And he's like, all right, whatever. Um, but he goes on a, 
I'm happy. Uh, I'm I'm happy that it wasn't a tragic story. I'll say that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I mean, again, my throwback to Shadow of the Colossus and the the black the black uh, curse mm-hmm. in, really embedding in your body. Um, that is a tragic story. Have you played it by any chance? Just I have not, but I'm I'm very aware of it. It's I, a I very it's like, tragic story, yeah. and it's a commentary on if on what it talks about being a hero in in really. Uh, that's another discussion because that's something I. It's so speaking yeah, of yeah. Uh, being a hero, though. Uh, our our boy rides off, and one of the very first things that happens is he's getting close to this village, and there's some samurai yep. that are outside this town, and they just decide to attack him. And he's he at first he's like, "Don't attack me. I don't have any problem with you." And but they persist, and then he just. Uh, I didn't realize that I read was reading up on it later, and it's like, oh, the reason his arrows literally shoot people's heads off is part of the demon curse in his arm giving him strength. But just very shocking burst of violence when he just shoots a guy's arm off and then shoots another guy's head off to the point where the other guy looks at his buddy whose head just falls off and he falls off his horse and just goes, ah, fuck this. And then he rides <laughs> away. And I was just like, Jesus Christ, Ashitaka. Like, what is... Like he, I kind of so if we're talking about how this character is very much static and the curse is a representation of anger getting the best of you, I think it's a it's a really good commentary on us as is if if we we are relating to Ashitaka, we we want to think that we are of, of sound mind, but also um, we have our outbursts of anger mm-hmm. and that sometimes it can get the best of us, and as someone who is trying to do so that um, a curse feeling anger can sometimes feel like a curse in, in, a, in a, to some weird degree, if that makes any sense, it feels like you lose all sense of yourself and you just lash out. And that's kind of like, maybe I'm overstretching here. Maybe I'm overthinking about it, but if we're going to talk about how we've mentioned the character is static and this is what the curse is, is supposed to represent then I think it's a very good indication of what the movie's really trying to subtly say, not be too on the nose about it. Yeah, the, the, um, there's a lot of themes going on in this movie, but one of the more prevalent themes is how we allow anger and hatred to blind us, and it can lead us down these paths of ruin. Because, And the, the thing that I, I kind of wanted to jump in earlier, but I was going to save it, but I'll just say it here now. Like, yes, this movie does have some tropes and some cliches, if you want to call them that, the Yojim Bo thing. Yeah. I was going to make a joke about Jungle Book yeah. a- analogy or whatever, but the characters in this story are very well flushed out. Yeah. And, v- and they feel very unique. And every single character in this movie, like all of them, there's no person who's just a mustache twirling evil villain. No. You understand where everybody's coming from. Like at first it seems like maybe Lady Eboshi is going to just kind of take the mantle as our just head villain, but around her this town that she's built, she she has all these lepers that she's that, taken under her wing who love her for making them feel useful again. She has all these women who she's saved from brothels who are mm-hmm. loyal to her. Like she's feels like she's like she encroached upon the forest in the first place to build the town, but I assume it's it's heavily hinted at that the forest lashed back and it's mm-hmm. been starting this war. Like she didn't want to go to war with the forest, but she feels like she has to. And all the characters feel very well rounded. Even even uh, uh, Jigo, Jiko, yeah, Jigo um, character, yeah. Like he, he becomes a little mustache twirly towards the end, but even him, it's like he's kind of just of this mindset that he's like, you know. We can beat the we can beat the forest god. We don't have to bow down to him. We're gonna win, yeah, or whatever. It's like you even kind of get where he's coming from. Like the characters are just so nuanced, and it's like it makes the fighting feel so much more painful because you do kind of like Iboshi's people. They're like. Our husbands have been killed by some of these wolves. Of course we hate these wolves. And the wolves are like, you're destroying our forest. Right. Of course we hate you. Like, and you're like, you? I kind of get it. <laughs> and poor poor Ashitaka is caught in the middle of this where he's like, you're both right and you're both wrong. And it's his mission to try to help them see that. And it's why he does actually work as that static character. Um, but, and, but him being cursed, like 
the other animals that get taken over by the demon spirit, they give in to their anger and hatred almost immediately, and they're taken over, whereas he's able to suppress it for the most part. Um, but it flares up like when he, he's forced to fight the samurai. Mm-hmm. His arm kind of bulges, and he, it starts to hurt him, and he's not sure what to do. Um, he goes into town. That's where he meets Jiko or Jiko. Yeah. I think it's different in both versions. I, can, I think it's Jiko in the Japanese version and Jiko. And Jigo, I yeah. don't know why. Yeah. Um, but it's the only name they changed. If, if they did change it, I could be completely <laughs> wrong. Uh, another fun fact about this podcast is I'm ignorant and stupid. So uh, <laughs> What? <laughs> um, okay. Joking. But it's, it was interesting to me as a first-time viewer. He meets this character. You can just tell by the character's design, his red nose and stuff, and the way he's acting, the way we st- immediately cut to him and we're spending a little time with him. They're like, okay, this character's going to be important. But then they have that cave scene. He kind of imparts a little bit of wisdom on uh, Ashitaka and sends him after. He's like, hey, you should go talk to the deer god. And then like the next morning he wakes up and he's like, I knew he'd go. I didn't think we'd be seeing that character again. I was very surprised when he showed back up. And I was extra surprised that not only did he show back up, I thought he'd just show up to like kind of get mixed in the fray. He shows up as like a representative of the emperor who's there to take the deer god's head. And he's essentially towards the back half of the movie kind of becomes our main villain. Yeah. It's interesting with that character because even though his motives seem a little bit more, um, as you like classify it, it's almost like kind of like a mustache twirler. Like it was really odd for me. And I almost kind of, I almost kind of wish he wasn't involved at all. Like it's, and it's not just because I'm not, I didn't like the English dub, (laughs) <laughs> voice of it. It's just, <laughs> I think the character itself as much as like his motives are clear, clear as day, but between the two factions, I go, I felt like maybe he's just an additional element that may not be needed because how that movie, how the movie ended was like really kind of fast. And it's like no repercussions came towards him at all. Like he just kind of, not went, him. No, but I, I do think it's like, I think that is part of what the movie's trying to say, though, is some people got out unscathed, some people didn't, and that's just kind of the way things go, I think, when these conflicts that, happen. That's um, what I was, that's why I wanted to take away from it, but at the same time, I think it's like that more, like maybe that justice porn type of feeling. It's like, man, this guy should have <laughs> got his up and coming, you know, like fuck this dude sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's me giving into the, the trope of like, uh, another trope of like, man, he should, he should have got his man. He should have got his, but he <laughs> didn't. What a jerk. Um, yeah. Do you have any feelings about Jigo, Lily? Oh man, I think that, that was pretty much the one character you're just like, yeah, I kind of just want him to get his head <laughs> chewed off by the wall or something. Uh, yeah, I'm right. Maybe there. even the little what is what are the little spirit guys called? I can't recall. Oh, uh, I can't remember. I didn't write it down, but yeah, those little wood spirits that make yeah, the yeah that, that would have been cool if they would have you know been, went berserk or something. I don't know. I'm weird. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's this weird. He, he he's there as a representative of this person who. The was the person that sent Iboshi to where she is in the first place, who she's kind of rebelling against. So it's like this, it adds this, he's sort of a representative of, of the guy who's essentially our faceless villain. Mm-hmm. There's like a throwaway line at one point that the emperor is like, if you bring me the dear God's head, I'll have eternal life. And that's kind of why this, presumably the priest guy's there because the king is going to pay him like a bajillion dollars for the head. And that's why he's trying to do. But there's there's something interesting, I think, thematically with towards the end of the movie when they're like, just give the head back. Everybody's dying. And he's like, no, it's about to be sunlight. We could win. Like there's a bit of like a edge. Like he talks a little bit about, he has a line where he's like, that's what humanity is. It's the space between heaven and hell. Like, as a good line. I like that line there, a lot. There, there is like, there's religious themes in the movie. There's spiritual themes in the movie. And there is like this aspect of, like even even San Princess Mononoke is like I hate humans. Humans are bad. Like there's stuff in there about the human experience, and I think he is a little bit him trying to feel like I'm not just at the whims of these death gods and stuff. I I make my own fortune in this world. Like I'm I'm doing a lot of work for the movie by saying all this, but there is. It's not. I'm not pulling it out of nowhere either. It is kind of layered in there. So yeah. I definitely didn't feel as harsh about the character, but. It, yeah, it is kind of surprising that he, like, literally the last shot of him, he's just like, well, I guess 
I can't tell these fools anything. And then that's just it. And you're just like, Oh, okay. The movie's over. Oh, oh interesting. Um, but, um, yeah, that, that, that was, that, that was it. Like that, that was the last scene with him. And I go, wait, what? <laughs> That's it? That's it with this guy? What? Yeah, even even Eboshi's last scene was, she's like, bring Ashitaka here. I want to talk to him. And then that's her last scene is her saying, bring Ashitaka here. I want to talk to him. And then we never see her again. That was like a weird last scene to leave off on, but okay. Um, I guess but, it's a sign of, uh, I, I guess the the way you could you can take it is the sense of her willingness to talk to the sure talk to the she's, guy. She's clearly in that scene. She's turned over a new leaf. She's like, he saved me. We're gonna live peacefully. Which it is a pretty quick one eighty for her character. But it's it's the end of the movie. We're trying to have a happy ending. It, it is what it, it, it is. feels rushed. <laughs> I mean that that's the only. I, I if, if I have two gripes, it's Jigo. Uh, maybe. Th- three um the voice actor jigo if i had and, seven and, gripes yeah <laughs> and the ending that's probably one of those things i might take away i go no eh, that's a, it's just a no but but so from here uh the scene that kind of confused me early on is we meet lady aboshi they're taking some uh oxen up a hill yeah, oh, yeah. and they're being mm-hmm. attacked by a wolf by the wolves or whatever and right. i was like because we don't know this town yet. We haven't been introduced to the town yet. And so this scene was confusing to me because I was like, why the fuck are they going up this mountain with these oxen when they know there's wolves that are going to kill them? And then later when you realize they're heading back to their own town, I was like, okay, that makes sense. But like at first I was like, what the fuck are you people doing here? Why? Why? You're going to get eaten <laughs> by wolves. And, and Iboshi, she, she kind of establishes herself as kind of cold because some of their people get knocked off the hill. And she's like, leave them. They're dead. Whatever. Right. Let's move on. Kind of which, like the survival of fittest. Like. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then, but then Ashitaka stumbles across a couple of the guys who survived, and he actually kind of endears himself to the town by bringing them back to the town. And we meet one of the guys' wives who is like, I hope my wife is never as flippant about me being alive as, as she is about this man being alive. Because she's, she's like, I brought your husband back. She's like, oh, he's still alive? Good for him, I guess. Don't be too <laughs> nice to him. I was like, whoa. All right. Wow. So she does not give a fuck. Uh, but she, she's kind of a funny character. I think her name she, was like Toko. Or, yeah, she was full of sass. I was like, <laughs> I don't know if I, like, I was like, eh, when I was. Played by happened. Jada Pinkett Smith in the dub. I know, man. That's uh, That was interesting. I was like, that was another cast member. I go, I don't know how I feel about you and the cast, but you work better than Billy Bob Thornton. So by <laughs> all, and that's my, that's my, that's my status right now is yeah. Billy Bob Thornton. And I, and I just can't get out of my head at the moment. <laughs> but so, I mean, I, I did skip over something major at, at before. I think before he gets into town, we do, uh, we get to see Ashitaka see princess Mononoke. Right. Mm-hmm. Cause her mother got shot, uh, by lady Aboshi. Um, by the way, a major plot point is that Lady Eboshi established this town called Iron Town. They dig up iron. She's created guns, and they're using these guns to go to war with the forest. So she shoots Mama Wolf, whose name I keep forgetting. I think it's Moto or something, something like, like that. Something like that. Um, but our introduction to this character is her sucking blood out of her Mama Wolf's wound, which is a she's just blood streaked face, and she just turns to look at the camera, and I was just like. There she is. Like I was like, this is a badass character introduction. Right. Um, but yeah, just right off the bat, you're just like, okay, she's cool. Like, and you want to know more about what her deal is, and obviously Ashitaka does too. But um, so, uh, but we go to the town. We get to learn more about Lady Eboshi, how she established the town, how she saved all these women that work in the factory. We meet the lepers. We see her like they're making guns for her. She wants to arm all the women. Um, but we get to establish Lady Eboshi as like the town loves her, but she's a little bit like cold and maniacal. We've already seen her leave some of her people for dead. So at this point in the story, we're, I, at least in my first time, I was like, she seems like the villain, but people like her. So I don't know how I feel about this character, which I think is great. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm with you. Um, so I, at that point, not knowing where the story was going, I was like, she's got guns and just, from the from standard anime environmentalism tropes, I'm like the characters with the guns are probably the bad guys. Right. But like she, again, like I said, they do a good job of making her more nuanced, and you get the feeling that she's only fighting back because she feels like she has to. And she, not only is she fighting the forest, we find out later she's fighting 
the emperor who sent her out to establish this town, but now that she's established it, he just wants to take all the glory. And she's like, no, fuck that. I did all the work. This is my town. I run things. And, and yeah, there's a little bit of egotism to it, but like, that's the thing about all these characters. They're human. They have human flaws mm-hmm. and it's why the bad things happen, but it's also what makes them interesting characters. I don't know how you guys felt about Lady Eboshi. I, I'm I'm in the same boat as you because um, much like that type of environmental, it usually it's something that involves the environment. You know, you see guns or something very industrial happen. Something very industrial. You're like, oh, right, bad guy. Uh, but then it kind of turns out like, well, but you're right. People, these especially these women, they love her to death, and they don't come off. Yeah, sure, they kind of they're very sassy, very sassy <laughs> women. They got some spunk, and I was like, oh, I mean, I'm I'm digging these characters. They seem like they really uh, love what she has done for them. Like she, they actually have a role in their lives instead of being at the brothel. I was like, okay, all right, well, that's dope. So I, I mad props there, but this main character is obviously very cold, and I don't. It's not rubbing me the right way, but at the same time, like, what's going on here? Like, and so, and, and so with Lady Eboshi was, um, I would say, is a character that it captivated, it didn't, didn't captivate, it didn't captivate me at first, but through the progression of the film, I started like, oh, it's not like I really liked her, but I just more like, oh, I find her interesting right, right now. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. it was kind of like the necessary evil yeah, type yeah, yeah. of thing. And it, it, that, for her, like that to me, that really reeled me in. I was like, ah, oh. I was like, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I see mean, what she, this she, film did. She does essentially serve as our villain, but she's nuanced, and she's not uh, she's not just pure evil. Which I did read is kind of a staple of Miyazaki films. It's not just oh, here's this evil bad guy that we have to fight. It's like no, there's reasons. There's reasons why they do the things they do, and and stuff like that. Which I think tends to make for a better villain character. Mm-hmm. If, if, there's, if you can just dredge up some empathy for the character, it's just going to make them more inherently interesting. Yeah. Um, but uh, Ashitaka gets to stay in town, and then Princess Mononoke-san attacks, and we get a really cool sequence. It's a very fluid, interesting animation where she's just running around it's slicing the people buildings. up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a really good sequence, and they actually, I was really surprised on how the film allowed these two characters to clash at one another, which felt like, I don't know, I think it was too early in the film, but maybe in the middle of the film, which kind of threw me off, which that I consider that to be kind of like a twist for me. Cause like that was something I was expecting to happen at the end of the film. And it did happen at the end of the film, but it was much more of a more epic scale. Yeah. And so when they had this battle or fight happen, I was like, Oh, they're actually duking it out right now. Yeah. I was like, shit. All right. Um, <laughs> And it's very just like, again, just like with Ashitaka, we're getting a pretty clear look into who San is as a character because she's attacking an entire town alone because she wants vengeance for Iboshi shooting her mom. And she, but then this is where Ashitaka like truly starts to intervene in the story and he, he gets in between them. And I thought this was like a really fun sequence where uh, San and Eboshi are clashing literally like sword to sword. Right. And he just walks into the middle of them and just grabs both of them. He's just like, stop. He's got his demon arm and he's just like pulling them apart. And they, there's like nothing anybody could do about it. It's just like, this guy's so fucking badass. Like, uh, and he just, he, Punches both of them, knocks them both out. They're like, you killed her. She's like, she's fine. Just take her. I'm taking the princess and I'm walking out of town and there's nothing any of you can do to stop me. Like he bends the guy's sword at one point. Right. He, he bends just, the, uh, <laughs> the personal guard for the yeah. uh, later. Lady they just, he picks her up, walks to the, the, the door. Mm-hmm. They're like, you need 10 people to open that door. And he's like, watch me. <laughs> right. And, and he just opened They're Like, Oh my God. And they just, he, they just let him walk out. But, at, but at one point I, I almost completely forgotten. This is very important. Someone fucking shoots him and he doesn't even flinch. Yeah. <laughs> he just like, he just, just keeps just, on walking. Yeah. They're like, he didn't even stop. But then he eventually does go down to his, his gunshot wound. And then it's princess Mononoke's turn to sort of repay the favor she yep. picks him up, takes him into the forest to the the pond where the deer god lives. Where he, they call him the deer god, but he's got like a monkey face and like chicken yeah. feet. 
Yeah, uh, that was that was um, interesting he's, character. He's, he's got antlers like the Pokemon from Pokemon X, which I assume that's a Japanese legend. That I'm not saying Pokemon X originated the deer with the crazy antlers. I assume that's from something. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting is the design element is his horns um, do kind of look like the squiggly demon things too. A little bit, yeah, I saw that. It visually sort of shows you the thin line between the life and death, the hatred and yes. the the happiness of the forest and stuff like that. It's because we find out later that this deer God is also the death God. He's both at night. He becomes the death God that who kills, takes life. And in the day he's the deer God, but he heals Ashitaka. So it's like the balance there. Yeah. Um, but he doesn't cure his demon curse yet. And Ashitaka is basically like, ah, he healed my wound, but I'm still going to die. So, <laughs> I guess he didn't think I was worthy. Like he's, he's he's like weirdly morose about it, and he's laying there. And that's when the boars come in at this point, I believe. Yeah. And you get to meet this really cool badass blind boar. I, I love it because Ashitaka, the, the big boar comes in, and and all the all the the baby boars are like, uh, our buddy that got. And we we realize that it's the boar from the beginning of the right. movie who went crazy and ran all the way to the east to attack the village because he was just so. Mm-hmm. Because we find out that that boar got shot by Lady Eboshi too, which is like the gunshot kind of. The iron. It is the, he, uh, he was the dying, iron. and yeah. it's what made him turn to anger and hatred. He wanted revenge and just went crazy and got overtaken by the demon god. Um, but this blind boar comes in, and uh, <laughs> Ashitaka's like, no, I killed him. He basically was like, I shot him in the face. So it was me. And I was just like, holy shit. Like, this guy's going to eat your fucking face off and like i think even san is like no don't kill him he didn't do do anything wrong and the boy's like no 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 i just want to make sure he's not lying he's like oh you did because because they're like you're lying our our friend never would have gotten taken over by a demon he was too proud and noble for that yeah 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 and ashtaka's like i hate to break it to you but and so it kind of flips where they're like no thank you for putting him down you did the right thing um and I was talking, he's still pretty wounded. And so he's just laying in. The boars are like, fuck the shit. At, at dawn, we attack. And, and San and the, and the wolves who are there, which at this point, I, I don't think the, the wolves and the, the boars had talked, talked. They just kind of growled at this point. And all of a sudden, like, it, it's it's like kind of symbolic because like now that Ashitaka has been brought into this forest world, all of a sudden the wolf is talking and the boar is talking and all the and the apes show up at one point and they're like, "Give us him, we're gonna eat him and gain his power." And she's like, "Fuck off, apes!" And they're just like, Urgh. and like I wasn't entirely sure like, yeah, I don't know. They, but show, they, they show up like twice. <laughs> And they don't heavily affect the story both times. They just kind of show up with glowing red eyes. And mm-hmm. like, and I was like, it felt like symbolically they were supposed to, because, you know, I feel like apes are the link between the spirit animals and humans. They're kind of the in-between. So I thought they'd be more relevant, but they kind of just are there. And then I didn't, I didn't get any a sense of like I didn't. I won't say they're they're like a gripe of mine. Like I'm, I'm sensing they they are for you with the story, but it was more of like do you didn't need. I didn't. I, I guess something. Maybe I missed something with that plot line with them involved. But after at the end of it, I was like I. Why were they there? Like they just want to eat the guy. That's it. Yeah, like that's it. I I feel like thematically purpose? they represent something, but I'm sorry, what were you saying, Lily? No, I'm saying like what was your purpose? I I honestly didn't see the importance of them being there yeah. either. So I thought it was funny. I just want to eat his face. <laughs> I was like uh what? <laughs> um, I I don't mean to gloss over there's a bunch of gorgeous stuff where they're going through the forest the first time and the second time where they meet the forest spirits. Everything looks beautiful. I read that the artist actually went to the forest and like drew their master drawings while looking at the real forest. And based off that, I, when, just because I'm glossing over it, it doesn't mean it's not beautiful and gorgeous. Right. No, no, um, no. I mean, it's something that I do think is really important though, is princess Mononoke choose some food and feeds it to Ashitaka like a baby bird. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't, no, <laughs> why I was so taken aback by that scene, but she like tries to put the food in his mouth. She's like, eat it, and he's just like, Ugh. and it just <laughs> drops it, and then she's like, Ugh. and she just chews it, and then like leans down and just like 
puts it into his mouth with her mouth, like literally like a baby. <laughs> I was like, I was like, they're kind of kissing right now, I guess. Like, it's just such a very interesting. <laughs> this, is their rem- fr- this is their romantic moment. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it's framed and shot in a way that's not, I expected there to be a close up of their mouths or whatever, but it just, the camera just stays back. Yeah, it, it never mm-hmm. it never it never dollies it never dollies or zooms in on the of her basically doing a mouth to mouth or just or, you know feeding the guy, creating creating that uh, the sense of insinuating anything else is happening. It's yeah, exactly. It's, it's framed in a way. It's like this is what's happening right now. She's feeding him, and that is it. Yeah, it's very much like she doesn't think anything of this because she has the brain of an animal essentially, and she's just doing like I just found that to be very interesting. I and if we're talking about watching this for the first time, I like this movie really like he's like he's in the town, and then he stops the fight, and then he's in the forest, and she takes him, and like he meets the deer god, like surprisingly early. You would think that's like the final the deer god would finally reveal itself, but now the deer god's like, hey, heal your gunshot wound peace and then he leaves right. and he's like holy shit he met the deer god but the, and then another boars are here and they're gonna attack like it's just crazy like where this movie goes um but so the boars are gonna attack uh san princess mononoke she decides that she's gonna fight with him there's a really great scene though i don't i don't mean to gloss over it, it cuts back to eboshi with with uh jigo mm-hmm. and they're basically like we're going to go to war with the forest and get the deer God's head. And then meanwhile, the boars are going to attack. So all this stuff is coalescing. And meanwhile, the emperor that sent Iboshi out there in the first place, he sent some samurai. They're knocking at the door. It's really interesting, all the conflicts that are starting to come to a head at this point. Right. But we get one of my favorite scenes of the movie uh, at nighttime, Ashitaka talking to the mom wolf. They have this really interesting, good conversation where she kind of explains where Princess Mononoke came from. She was just this human child that was abandoned that mm-hmm. she took in. Um, and she's just like, I'm going to solve everything and I'm going to fix all this. And she just kind of laughs in his face. She's like, humans suck. Everyone's going to die. And by the way, I'm dying too, but I'm going to take Eboshi's head with me. So fuck, fuck her. I'm going down swinging. And it's just like this cynical old wolf it's a very good setup for where she, what she does towards the end of the movie. Right. right. She right, literally yeah. is laying in the pond and she's like, I was literally laying here waiting for Eboshi to kill her. And now you're making me use the last of my strength to save you. Whatever. I guess that's what I'm doing. And it's just like, no, even she kind of buys into the idea of peace and stuff towards the end. Although I think <laughs> her severed head does rip Eboshi's arm. <laughs> well, there, it's a, yeah. it, there, there is a, she did uh, save uh, a little bit of that. Hatred. There's a little gag about you know when you cut a wolf's head off, you know they're still you know they're they're still alive for like for a momentary moment, and when that happens at the end of the movie where she gets her whole right arm ripped off, and her bodyguard comes and saves her, she makes that joke again. Yeah, see, I told you, and (laughs) and the head and the head disappears. I'm like, (laughs) that made me chuckle. That gave me a good laugh. (laughs) I was like. Huh. The, the, the moment where the head head bites her arm off is it is actually kind of weirdly played for a comedic beat because she the the she's like was that her head like <laughs> just like well, she's just so like nonplussed by it it's really funny but to ramp up to the end of the movie all these conflicts come to the head um, all the boar guys uh, I think his name's uh, Okoto yep um, all his boar people die there's a really weird thing where all the all the secret asshole samurai are wearing the boars. Yeah, like, and the way they move is so creepy and weird, and it's just very unsettling. But he's blind, and so he doesn't know any better. He's like, "My warriors have risen with me. We're gonna go get the deer god, and she's he's gonna make this right." And they're following him because they want to kill the deer god. Meanwhile, Iron Town's under siege. Uh, at one point, Ashitaka, because he's he's been told to leave because he's not going to get involved in the boar human conflict. So he tries to go back to town. That's under siege. So he comes back to tell Lady Eboshi, like, stop going after the deer god. Your people are under attack. And she does a bit of a heel turn here and just goes, well, they're armed. I taught them well. I got to go kill me a god. And she just keeps going. And he's like, fuck that. I'm going to stop this. And he just never really loses that determination. And he really, at this point, is determined to save San, too, because he knows she's caught up in the middle of the conflict. Everything kind of comes to a head at the pond. Okoto gets possessed by the demon god because he lets his hatred start to take over. Mm-hmm. And she's trapped, weirdly. This is the kind of stuff where it's like, I never in a million years would have thought 
just the idea that she was on him and the demon spaghetti keeps her trapped to his body. It's just such a weird choice to make, which it totally works, but it's like, I never in a million years, if I was scripting the story would have been like, yeah. And then she's stuck to his snout because the demon spaghetti has her trap, but it totally works and it's scary and creepy. And it's, it's, it's it's a very unsettling uh, moment in that movie when, uh, uh, what's, uh, what's his name again? I always, uh, always can, I can't remember his name. The, uh, Ashitaka Ashitaka goes into the boar and rescues her. That yeah. like that was like a really unsettling moment. But he doesn't even actually. He gets to her. Yeah, that's right. right. He gets thrown back. He gets out. thrown out. And then but the that, wolf comes and gets her. Right. Yes. That's right. That's right. And that just that sequence alone, I just felt so uncomfortable. And but that was mainly because of a big part was tore for the the sound design. Yeah. The sound design in this movie is really good. The sound of the demon, uh, all that stuff. Yeah. Like the sound design of the, the demon was really good. And the, what I, what I found really interesting about that part is the fact that she was engulfed in that gooey stuff. Mm-hmm. Yet, she didn't get cursed. Yeah, she she was she had sort of an innocence and a purity about her where she she wasn't she hadn't given in to her hatred. In fact, she was trying to stop Akoto, and she was trying to wake him up, and so she was still like kind of pleading with him. So she, I, I there was a moment when she first touched him where I was like, "Don't touch him." That's exactly what happened to Ashitaka. Like you're gonna get cursed, but you know by the end of it, it all ends up not mattering that much anyway. And at this point, um. Ashitaka's curse, it's like grown to his chest, it's starting to overtake his body, but he hasn't, he still hasn't given in. The deer god comes out to try to heal Akoto. I don't specifically remember the sequence of events, but the wolf gets up to battle Akoto. The deer god intervenes. He takes both Akoto and uh, Moto's life because there's a moment where Jigo and Iboshi are watching the deer god because Iboshi's getting ready to shoot him. And she does shoot him. She shoots him in like the back and he, it just whiffs through him and it doesn't affect him. He's like, you got to shoot off his head. And so he t- they're just very surprised that he takes the lives because they think he's like this life-giving thing. They don't realize that he's two sides of the same coin. But Eboshi shoots off his head and then he starts going haywire. He just turns into this giant monster and he starts letting loose this goo that just kills everything it touches. And then at this point, this is where we've reached our all hope is lost moment. People start dying. There's there's a point when it stretches to the town and the townsfolk are trying to escape. And there's a moment when the lady's like, don't go that way. Don't run across the bridge. And they do. And you just see this black wave take a bunch of people. I was just like, holy shit, those people all just died. Like, <laughs> it, it's really crazy, like this final sequence. It's it, it's a it's very unsettling for it was unsettling for me because it was it was a representation of as we talked about the anger and hatred taking over and that was in a way I don't want say, unsettling not uncomfortable it was just like oh man like this the 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 violence that happens in this movie the, there's like a there's kind of like a oh shit oh fuck that was but I don't think I ever had like a oh fuck yeah moment it was more like it, it was more of a reaction like, oh my goodness. There's a couple of times <laughs> when uh, Ashitaka shoots some of the samurai that are after him that feel kind of fun. I mean, he's just slicing and You can and dicing say them. that they deserve it because he was unwilling to participate. But at the same time, I was like, even that level of violence in, a, in this film, I was like, I was not expecting that. It was kind of cool, but man, that's... I wonder how far they're going to push it next time around, if there is a next time around. Yeah. And so Jigo grabs the head. He tries to make off with it. And uh, Ashitaka, and there's there's a really nice moment between Ashitaka and Sam where she's like, humans suck. Everything's fucked. We can't do anything. He's basically just like hugs her. And he's like, we're going to save everybody. We're going to do it. It's really nice. Right. Um, And they get to Jigo and they take the head and, I'm not going to hold this against the movie because Ashitaka just kind of demonstrates knowledge throughout the whole movie. But there's a moment where he's like, human hands have to return the head. It's the only way. And I was like, why do you know that? Okay, whatever. <laughs> but Yeah, it was random. That was never mentioned in the movie. Like it just it just kind of happened. We're like, uh, why does he, when did we learn this? But yeah. I guess if, this, if we need to solve the problem right now, okay, fine. The reason I'm willing to forgive it is because thematically, it's really beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's like, it has to be humans who have caused this grief making a concession and offering it back to 
saw Th- that's this. why I was able to forgive it but, like, I mean, but it's I like am. it's like why does he know that but we get this great sequence they hold up him and San both hold hold the head up which I don't know why this is an audio medium but I held my hands in the air <laughs> like people could see me um, <laughs> but they hold on to each other this really dramatic wave washes over everything he puts his head back on kind of fades into the mist and we see like life return to the forest around them. And I don't know, like as someone that's seen the movie before, like how does this ending, uh, I guess just to fully wrap it up. And then basically everyone, Iboshi's like, I was kind of an asshole. I'm going to be better. Ashitaka's is like, I'm going to live in Iron Town and San's going to live in the forest and we're going to still hang out all the time. And we're going to find a way to make both worlds work, which I felt like was a really, it wasn't just, we're going to be together forever. And it's awesome. It's kind of like, we're going to be from two sides of the different sides of the tracks, but we're going to and figure it out. how like, to coexist. Like that. It's a nuanced ending, but I don't know how, as someone that's seen it before, like obviously I imagine you like that it has a happy ending. It makes it maybe more rewatchable in that way. Yeah. I, I, for myself. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't like a happy ending? <laughs> I mean, I, I will, I will say that I almost thought, but I, I, again, I don't know why I thought this. I'm like, Oh, they're going to end up together. They're gonna, And I'm like, I mean, the film never really ever hinted at that in the first place. It's more like, it's something I've seen before plenty of times, why am I expecting this? Because this film has nowhere indicated of that happening at all. Like that's San and Ashitaka being together forever and, you know, right off in the sun. Like I, I just hate the fact that it was in my head and I was, I don't know if I was wanting it to happen. It was my, I was expecting it to happen. But even though I was watching a movie that provided the information, like that's not going to happen at all, man. Like, there's like, why do you? Why would you expect something like that? I, I will push back against that just a little bit, in the sense that a lot of times I hate when movies like really shoehorn a romance in, where it's like it's a guy and a girl, and they got to get together by the end. But I do think that the movie, even though this really isn't a love story, mm-hmm. it gives you a lot of indications that Ashitaka and San. Are they meant to find be or something. things in each other. Like he obviously is a bit smitten with her when he first sees her, and he's representative of the good of humanity mm-hmm. that she's never really experienced. And so, I do love that it's not some overdramatic. They kiss, yeah. and they're getting married by the end of it. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I do. There's definitely enough in the film. Like as much as they don't romanticize her feeding him the food, but they save each other. They. It makes sense to me that these characters would be interested in each other. So I would say, like, when you say, like, oh, there's no indication that they should get together, it's it's layered in there somewhat. Es- okay. Especially, like, mm. just what they represent to each other. She represents the spirituality and this, like, naivete and, like, this freedom. Because he obviously comes from this very ritual-oriented yeah. uh, village who's all about, like, following structure and stuff. And she's just this wild, free spirit. Like this, And the thing that I do like about the movie is the movie doesn't dwell on that kind of stuff that much. This, this could have been totally about the rigid spirit man meets the cool wolf girl. She could have been a full-on manic pixie dream girl. Right. Uh, but they don't do that. But it still makes sense to me that they're, he's like, I, I, I like, I definitely ship them. For lack of a better term, okay, okay, um, I'm down for that. Yeah, but how about you? Like, I, like you, like in terms of like Ashitaka and San. I mean, you're rooting for them to get together. You like where it ends up, kind of on a ambiguous. I mean, I I think he kind of left the room for maybe there will be another one someday, mm. right? Because sure, like you said, it maybe it wasn't specifically said that they were meant to. St- be together at the end of this movie but they kind of did click in that or at least it seemed like it but the fact that they both ended up in different places to try and fix and try to coexist kind of hints that there should be another one where there's more continuation i I, I like this pitch of a sequel a sequel to princess (laughs) mononoke queen mononoke there you go (laughs) yeah look at that uh but yeah so that's i mean that's the movie for the most part i in a nutshell yeah yeah, I think, I think we actually hit a lot of uh, pretty much most of the notes I wanted to hit. I we talked about the characters. I like yep. the depth of the characters. The animation, like, look, we could, if especially if we were animation nerds, we could sit here and talk about how great the animation is for hours. It's good. It's a Miyazaki film. Everybody knows Miyazaki films look great. I mean, man, it's it is so nice to revisit this movie 
and not revisit, obviously, this is the first time I've seen it. Terrible choice of words. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but to see a 2D hand-drawn animated movie, it sucks to me that we're getting away from that kind of stuff. And all, like all our Disney movies, like as gorgeous as the Disney movies can look now, mm-hmm. like I think Frozen does look really good. 20 years down the line, it's going to look like crap. Whereas Princess Mononoke is always going to look good. Exactly. I think there's a, there's a sense of, this is kind of like how I feel about, um, again, I'm bringing it back uh, to my sense of like 2D video game art. Like the, the, you go back, not just because of n- nostalgia, it's because there's a certain craft and quality to them that they feel like they stand the test of time and it's not because oh it's because I just like it because I you know played it as a kid or watched it as a kid I feel like when you watch hand drawn animation there's there's something you really can't put your finger on about it because you could pop it in any single time and never feel like man you know what maybe the dialogue and story may feel uh, maybe feel dated but the animation itself, like you just watch the animation and you go, and it's an- beautiful. It's beautiful. It's like, it's not, that doesn't feel dated at all. It's, it's beautiful paintings and beautiful drawings. And those have, drawings and paintings have been around for, God, uh, my art history made, my art history teacher Don't will worry fucking about shoot it. me, will shoot me. <laughs> for but for any, dozens of years. It has been, yeah, they've been around <laughs> for centuries, man. They, and it's just, they, they, there's a reason why they stand the test of time. There's a, there's a certain quality about the reason why they stand the test of time. And, and, and you know, technology eventually evolved. And, you know, of course, painting techniques evolved too, but... There's, there's just something that it doesn't capture. There's, there's a sense of warmth. I think that's what it is, a sense of warmth. And it's, that's, and it's kind of like how I feel about sprite stuff in, you know, 2D animation yeah. as well. There's just like just sense of warmth and craft to it. Not that I have anything against the 3d animation whatsoever at all. I mean, that was, that was my major and that's something I still, I don't have like, I got a, I mean, I have a buddy who works for a video game company doing uh, the in-game cinematics or, or cinematics, excuse me. And there, 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 the amount of detail and painstaking, Mm-hmm. hours that they put in just for a simple eye movement or a twitch just to make it feel like it make it feel like it's natural that's how your eye would move or something like that that's i mean yeah, i'm not i don't want to take that away from them but 2d just feels like it's it's just kind of i don't know why it feels so tactile for well some that's reason. something that uh speaking of like eye twitches and stuff like that something that i don't think animation in general gets enough credit for i used to kind of scoff not scoff, but I was kind of confused when I would hear people talk about the acting in an animation movie. And I'd be like, oh, like the voice acting. And it's like, no, the acting, the people that are drawing these characters are their body language and their faces. They're still having to do the kind of things that actors do mm-hmm. to convey emotion, to right. convey how these characters feel. These artists, not only are they amazing artists, but they're actors in their own right. Mm-hmm. They, are, they are the actors that are performing these characters. And it's something that I don't think a lot of people talk about. And I wish they would because it's really impressive. And it's kind of a shame, not that I put a lot of stock in like Oscars or anything like that, but it's right. a shame that we don't take that kind of stuff seriously. We don't take voice acting that seriously, which we should. This movie came out in 1997. It still looks fucking great. The story is for my money, pretty tight. As long as there's going to be war and conflict in the world, which unfortunately there probably always will be, and as long as we, and, and movies with environmentalist messages like this one are only going to get more and more relevant the longer we go on. And it's going to unfortunately, feel, and it's and it's going to come off timeless. And that's the thing. Like to me, when I watch this movie, I don't. You could have told me it was made last year and it came out this year. I mean, to me, you say 1997. I go, I don't feel 1997 here. That's the thing. And that's, uh, you know, any other movie, you can probably feel such thing, but the, the the themes that they're talking about, the story that they're talking about, like I said, story we've all heard and seen before, but how it's presented and what it's dealing with, it's like, why does it feel so timely right now? Like, why? Like, just, (laughs) it's so weird that it's 23 years ago. It's like, 
This seems relevant right now for some reason, guys. Yeah, one on. one could say that it's a classic. <laughs> I, I, I would agree with that. It qualifies yeah. for yeah, the show. I would agree with that. I, I, I agree. Clear Tented Classics. And here on Clear Tented Classics, <laughs> we do scores. Oh, and so God. I'm going to start us off because I explained to them beforehand, but just for anybody that's new to the show, which thanks for tuning in, all three of you fans of Espy and Lily, like I said, uh, <laughs> I do rankings out of 10 here. Okay. Um, and my rankings will seem a little harsh in retrospect, but that's because for the most part, while I, I've had a couple duds here and there already in this show, <coughs> Escape from New York. Um, oh, but, no. <laughs> uh, I'm a little harsh on, on my. So, for example, I gave the movie The Godfather, which would, for, in, for my money, in, in, by any stretch of the imagination on a normal scale, it would be a 10 out of 10. Right. I gave it an 8.5. Oh, God. Um, you pissed off a lot of people. No, I, I explained to them <laughs> I explained to them that by giving The Godfather an 8.5, which is maybe one of the greatest movies of all time, if that means I never give anything a 9 or a 10 on the show, I'm willing to live with that. I wanted to establish a bar. I didn't want to just give it a 10. So when I say my rating for this movie, don't hold it against me. It's still a very good score. But for Princess Mononoke, I'm going to give it a seven. Okay. Um, okay. But a seven on this show is really good. Um, I disagree. Because <laughs> <laughs> what? We got fight. We got fight. No, uh, but I am fighting words. The, the movie is very good. The themes hold up well. The characters are so interesting. When I first started the movie and I saw that it was two hours and thirteen minutes long, I was like, "Fuck!" <laughs> but I didn't feel a second of it. Uh, the movie the movie does not feel that long. It just sweeps you up along the journey. Mm-hmm. It's great. I really liked it. It's a movie I'll probably revisit. And I, I'm now, after this, my appetite's really been wet for maybe diving into Spirited Away and Howl's Moving Castle and stuff like that. I'm extra excited to do those. I'm really glad you guys suggested this movie. I'm glad I finally watched it. It wasn't even really something that I was thinking about at all. And now all of a sudden... I'm living in a world where I've seen Princess Mononoke, and I'm really glad I've seen it. So uh, yeah, SB- now he lives in a better world. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So SB, let's let's hear your final thoughts and your score. Uh, oh, I should say, you guys can give it whatever fucking score you want. Right. If right. you want to give it a ten, that's fine. You, you're not be be oh, no, no, holding no, to my shit. I'm pretty. I'm, I'm a I'm a stickler as well. For me, I am actually going to go a notch higher than you and say eight out of ten. Okay. Um, the reason you why can I, give point fives if you want. Uh, no, no, I know. I, I mean, I, I used to do that on my uh, other podcast where I give it like a score, but now it's just more of recommendations than anything else. But I will say I do recommend this uh, as if you are an animation buff and if you are just like I haven't like. I, I've heard about this and I don't know. I'm like, I would recommend checking it out. I know sometimes people look at that runtime and go, Oh my goodness. An animated, animated movie is this long. Yeah, yes, it is. So animated movies generally are much shorter because it's so hard to make them. Right. And th- mm-hmm. An animated movie being this long is crazy. It is crazy. It, it blows my mind that it's this long, but I, I agree with Jake though. Once the movie starts going, like I don't feel I don't feel the length. And I think that's because the pacing of the film and the reason why I feel like when you feel something, the length of a film, it's because there's information that is not important. When you have information that's not moving the story, uh, moving the movie forward, that means you're at a low point. That means it could have been cut off. Another, I will give one example from one of my favorite directors, uh, Gareth Edwards, uh, Evans, excuse me, Gareth Evans. Oh my God, um, the guy who directed uh, the Raid, the Raid movies, and uh, Apostle. That's on Netflix right now. Is he Rogue One as well? No, that's Gareth Edwards. Okay, that's that's why it the it's the the Gareth E guys, but Gareth <laughs> Evans. Um, he had <laughs> talked about there was a sequence that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, in the Ray 2, it was an awesome action sequence. It's on Vimeo. You can watch it, or it's online somewhere. It's a great gunfight. It's excellent. But he had said that when he had put it into the cut, it didn't move anything forward. It just kind of put the movie at a halt. And he goes, it fucking sucked because I shut down this place for six days, spent a couple hundred thousand dollars on it, and I'm not using it in the film. 
so if you know something that doesn't, and that's when you when you watch something, you go, I'm not getting anything out of it, then just cut it. But that's not how I feel about Princess Mononoke. That's that's the point I'm trying to get at. I feel like everything I see, I'm getting new bits of information, even if it's just nuggets. It's something to keep you moving on, uh-huh. and that's perfect. And that's why I like slow burn movies too, because. Even though there's not action on screen, something is still unfolding. You're still engaged, and you're like, ah, okay. And when the payoff happens, you're like, oh, yes. Princess Mononoke is a perfect example of that. The reason why I, I may speaking of praise for it, it's just I haven't, I didn't get to that height of like a, like a ten out of ten sure. for it. I didn't reach that peak of like. Oh my god, that was fucking amazing! Like, no, I didn't, I didn't reach that level, but I feel like upon maybe other viewings, I might get there. But for my first, secondish viewing of this movie, it's a it's an eight out of ten for me, and I highly recommend it watching it. Not just simply because it's Studio Ghibli, well, that's part of the reason, but also it's still it's a fantastic animated movie and a really great story that's still. Unfortunately, it still feels timely. Yeah, very nice. How about you, Lily? What's your score? Final thoughts? Well, I mean, as much as you guys might hate me for it, I still, like I said in the beginning, I would give it a nine and a nine point five, if not ten. All right. And the only reason I wouldn't give it a ten is only because, and you guys can hate me for it, but I didn't feel like it squeezed my heart like Pokemon, the first movie. So. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, who didn't cry at the end of that's, Pokemon? That's right? what I'm saying. So. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> uh, okay, so speaking of other movies, uh, the very last thing I like to do... <laughs> go first, Lily. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, I gotta go first. Yeah, well, go no, first. I'll, go, I'll go first. I'll okay. say, uh, I, I like to... Rec- like, the whole point of the podcast is we watch movies that are classics. Like, yes... The hook is that I haven't seen them because I'm a failure when it comes to movies. Um, so I like to recommend, but I have seen a lot of movies that not a lot of other people have seen. So sometimes I like to recommend stuff that's a little off the beaten path. And so for this one, I'm going to give them a twofer because this is both of these movies are less obscure than I usually go. Okay. Um, okay. So I like to give people a little bit more to work with. Um, and and I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay in the world of Japanese animation for this. Okay. Personally, you guys don't feel beholden to that. I'm going to recommend a show, which I don't normally do, uh, My Hero Academia. Oh, that's actually pretty good. Yeah, and, and the, th- mm. the thing with My Hero Academia is it's maybe one of the most popular animes of all time, so right. it's not like a super off-the-beaten-path recommendation. But I, I kind of think of it, in t- I, I related to this movie a little bit because it's popular for a reason. It's because it's fucking good. It's really good. And, it's, and Studio Ghibli is popular for a reason because it's good. Yeah. These are stories that appeal to a wide demographic of people and, and they're popular, not by chance. My, my hero really, cause I grew up on the Dragon Ball Z Ooh. and hello. <laughs> oh boy. The, 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 there, the Yu Yu Haku show. I do think Yu Yu Haku show actually has a lot going on, but like, okay. yeah, like Dragon Ball Z, Naruto, Whatever. I love those stories, but my hero feels like the next step of those stories. This is good. This is shown in anime with characters that it has time to drill down deep on. Whereas Dragon Ball Z, love me some Vegeta, but I mean, character development was not Dragon Ball Z's strong suit. Uh, My hero, you've got a class of 20 different characters and even more characters that eventually get sprinkled in you feel like you know all these characters and the, and you love them and you get to pick your favorites. Like I'm a, I'm a Momo guy. I, I'm a Bakugo guy. People that have watched the show understand what I'm talking about. It's, I sound like I'm talking gibberish to anyone that has I'm has interested. It. But um, it's a great fucking show. But I'm recommending that and I'm also going to recommend another very popular anime movie. But this one I feel very strongly about because if you haven't see it, seen it, please see it. And I missed the boat on it. This was in theaters at one point and I am kicking myself now because I, if I had gotten to see this movie in theaters, I would have just been so blown away because the animation is just on another level, but there's a movie called your name. I believe the Japanese version, if you want to be all nerdy about it is Kimi no wa or something like that. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, Kimi no, no Nawa. Uh, Kimi no Nawa. Yep. Um, yep. but, this movie 
holy shit. I, I, I'm, this movie knocked my socks off. It's gorgeous. The love story is unlike anything I've ever seen. And it's a very complex movie, so much so that I'm really glad that I watched it and then immediately bought it and watched it again because knowing where it goes the second time I was able to pick up on stuff I missed mm-hmm. early on, especially where it's driving at. But there's so much craft and love and care and the story. It's just, I'm not going to spoil it because the whole point is me recommending movies that you haven't seen. But trust me, if you're a fan of animation or you're a fan of romance or anything in that, your name is fucking incredible. I love that movie so much. I want everybody to watch it so I can talk about it because I feel like nobody's seen it because I'm one of the only stupid otaku Japanese nerds that I know. Uh, so please, everybody watch your name and talk to me about it. And we can all, and by the way, I bawled like a fucking baby at the end of this movie. This movie oh, well, I crushed me like, in a good way. Check this out. Um, but like, it was kind of embarrassing because I was watching it in the living room at home and my, <laughs> my family came home and they heard me like <laughs> audibly crying. They're like, are you crying? And I was just like, go away. Like, yeah, leave me alone. It's sad. Uh, but whatever. The movie's great. I love it. Please watch your name and also check out My Hero. You know, if you're ever looking for a show to watch, it's so good. Uh, S. Little Lily? SB's point at Lily. Let's, okay. Lily, what's your recommendation? Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, I disagree with the whole uh, Dragon Ball Z characters. Um, <laughs> not <laughs> growing got- stories because Vegeta actually has a very dramatic background. Of course. If you really get into it, man, that guy has gone through some shit. <laughs> that's, why, that's, why he's my, that's why he's my favorite. I, I love his character arc. All right. So uh, besides that... Um, Okay, well, how many recommendations can I do? Because, oh my gosh. Just do like one or two. Like, okay. give, give, you, give the audience two. two like, no, kinda, just like, one is fine. <laughs> <laughs> <don't have> to. <laughs> if you want to recommend the Pokemon movie, you can. Let's see. Well, I, I like kind of already said that by yeah. the whole heart squeezing is there, thing. Is there a movie that you don't think a lot of people have seen that you'd like um, them to see? Yeah, yeah. I think one of my favorite movies, um, it's also in the Asian category. Okay. Uh, it'll be Train to Busan. Was that Train to Busan? Oh, okay. Yeah, the Train to Busan. Is a South I Korea. haven't seen that. It's been on my list for forever. Oh, Do you man. have uh, Amazon Prime? Yep, uh, it's it's on my list. I'm gonna watch it eventually. I just okay. haven't gotten. Yeah, to it. I think it's on either Netflix and Amazon Prime. Both. I've seen it because uh, I heard her talking about it, and then because the sequel Peninsula is coming out this year. Really? Yes. I didn't know it was getting a sequel. Very interesting. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to say any, like, I don't want to say anything about it. I just want, we're going to let you in. You go shouldn't. Blind. This just is go, just telling people yeah. to go watch it. Just go you, watch you it. Gotta watch go it. watch it. Go watch it. There is yes. a reason why people love this movie. And when I, watched, when I watched it for the first time, I was like, oh my <laughs> God. Yeah. Because when it's, I first told him about it, he was like, eh, maybe. <laughs> and then he ended up watching it by himself. <laughs> and then I came on, he was like, oh my God, I watched the movie. And I, cried at the end oh yeah (laughs) i cried it's let me put it this way you would think that this type of genre especially in america is overplayed but i will say south korea does it did it 10 times better (laughs) and the ending the uh i'll say there's a child actress in there uh it's a child actress uh child and a father involves a child and a father going to train Mm -hmm. busan that is, I am. That's all I'm talking about. It crushed me because I was like, I probably am like, I probably am like, I maybe this is gonna happen. But when it did happen, I'm like, it still got me. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> no! <laughs> because because the the the, the, act, the child actress is she is incredible, man. Sure. She's really mm-hmm. good. So I'll, I'll really check good. it out. I will. It's been highly on my list for a long time. Highly recommend it. And th- it was my first time seeing it this year as well so awesome. so i have so he was missing out for a bit i was missing out for four years guys <laughs> yeah how about you sp what's your recommendation uh recommendation oh my goodness i'm i think i'm gonna stay in this category as well of foreign um films uh you know what i'm not a big fan i i will say i'm not a big fan of western films but a uh, South Korean film called The Good, The Bad, and The Weird. Oh, I have not heard I of this. I own it. And 
I got acclimated with this movie because at the time, Apple trailers was really popular. That was like the one site I would go to and check out all these trailers because I was not finding anything on IMDb or really, I don't think YouTube was really that popping off at the time, but Apple trailers had some of the most unique movies on there that I've seen. And of course now I hit, you know, go to YouTube or Facebook, whatever now. But at the time I was like, I've never even heard of this. I was like, what is this? And I saw the trailer, I go, this actually looks kind of fun. So never saw it in theaters. I just bought it. I just bought it on Blu-ray and it's like, let's see what it's all about. And I go, man, this movie is hella fucking fun. Oh my God. And the kind of the, the thing that these um, these gentlemen are going after kind of it, it gave me a really good laugh because what they were going after is not I will say uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say anymore <laughs> okay. I'm not gonna say anymore because the ending was like kind of gave me a good laugh because if you understand the commodity of such ob- of such thing you'd be like oh ha <laughs> there ah and I'm, I'm Click and hit in my head. I'm like, ah, I got, I got you, I got you. That's hilarious. I like that one. That's one of them. Uh, and then, oh, you guys are getting more lucky. One, lucky me, you. I will I'll suggest one more, but I will say I will preface that people who have recommended this movie to, um, they say that the first two acts are great, but the third act feels like a really big shift. But by that time, I'm already invested in the movie. It came out in 2007, had a very limited release in the U.S. It's called Sunshine. Okay, the Danny Boyle movie? Yeah, it's called Sunshine. And I will say that, I only say that because that was like the most consensus when I let people borrow the movie. Like, yeah, I mean, I really liked it. But then this thing happened. I go, "Was was it X, Y, Z? And they're like, yes. I go, I understand why you feel that way, but by that time, I was just kind of on board for the movie as is, and the, the plot is the sun is dying, but the thing is, you don't know why or how the sun is dying, but the people involved are taking it very seriously to the point, it's like, okay, well, I guess I don't need to be told the scientific explanation of why the sun is fucking dying here, so they're going to reignite it with the appropriate name of Icarus 2. Oh. Uh, I was like, oh. I was like, oh, I like that name. First off, if you know of your mythology, you're like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. It's a good one. Um, but yeah, that's another one of mine. And I actually do own as well. So if you are interested, Jake, I do own. I, the I, might, I might take you up on that because I own Sunshine and you talked about seeing Spirit Away. I own Spirit of Boy too. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I am your movie library, Jake. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I seem to have permanently checked out Blade Runner 2049 from you. <laughs> <laughs> you got to tell the story. So, okay, so, uh, so the funny thing is, Jake had recently, uh, at the time, messaged us in a, in a group chat with all, my, uh, with all our friends. And he goes, oh, Espy, you know, I finally checked out Blade Runner 2049. I, have, I still have your copy. <laughs> and I go... Oh, I was like, oh shit, you have my copy. Well, <laughs> you can keep it because I bought myself another copy because <laughs> I couldn't remember where it was or who. I thought I had misplaced it. I was like, I was going crazy. I'm like, I'm like, where the fuck is my copy of this movie? I feel so bad. <laughs> and and I mean, in hindsight, like thankfully it was it was cheap online but at the same time i thought it was hilarious that jake had it for this while i'm like i forgot that i gave let, let jake borrow it yeah i did i did a back-to-back i wanted to watch it so i watched the first blade runner first uh-huh. which spoiler alert for a future episode and then i watched 24 now which by the way 2049 was excellent yeah really good i'm kind of glad i own it on blu right now apparently <laughs> Because <laughs> it's a good movie. Um, oh, man. Uh, so let's see. Real quick here at the end. I forget to do this sometimes with other people, but uh, do you guys have any plugs? Any any place you guys would like people to find you, reach out to you? Anything that you want to promote? Uh, I know Espy's got something. Uh, okay, yeah, I do have a... Uh, I'll, I'll talk about my uh, video game podcast. I, I will admit, uh, by the time this gets released, um, I will say that... Uh, for a long over close to a year, I hadn't done an episode, but recently I actually did one with Jake. Uh, we talked about Street Rage Four, so 
uh, do go check that out if you can, and do check out all the previous episodes on our, on the video game podcast that I co-host. It's Co-op Mode Reviews. Uh, we've done several episodes. We've been together since 2012. We are essentially a bunch of college buddies got together and decided to do a podcast. But just to, just to kind of give you a heads up, though, uh, the episodes are not flowing like water because essentially life. And we do it for a hobby. We're not getting paid to do it. But you guys have, a, especially if someone's new to your show, you have yeah. an incredibly large backlog. We do have our library of episodes is very it, it is it is large i'm happy to say that there are games that we do cover that i never really saw any major outlet cover and I'm, that's not a weird flex by any means i'm just saying that <laughs> i never heard about this game weird but, flex bro <laughs> yeah <laughs> but one of the, one of the one of my friends had heard about had came across it and talked about it and like that's how we got to know about the game is like well we played it and we did it for the show and you know in good or bad whatnot and that's kind of how it happened it's like you know oh we heard i heard about this game what do you guys think you guys want to try it? it's like why not yeah and i'll say um as someone that listened to a couple episodes myself i find that you can jump in at any point if there's a game that they're talking about that they're interested in you can totally jump in the chemistry works just fine for a newcomer but you know, as someone who's a podcast aficionado myself, I think there's a lot of merit to starting from the beginning and watching I, them grow. Like, even if maybe it's not something that you realize, like, I guarantee you the way you guys sound in your first episode compared to the well oiled machine that you've eventually become by 2019. Yeah. Like, it's, it's a fascinating journey. Um, it is. It's uh, not only just in terms of uh, quality of equipment either, it's just. I think we've gained a, a lot more, a better understanding in terms of uh, of ourselves to what we've grown to like more along the way. Like, just a quick story that my friend Josh, at the beginning of the podcast, AAA games, like you know, you you name it, like Call of Duty, you know, Gears of War, that sort of thing, back in you know, starting 2012, and now the guy lo- is an absolute love, you know, still loves those type of games, but man his affinity for independent games has grown exponentially because of the podcast. So, Very cool. So that's, I mean, if you want to talk, if you want to hear about a transition, that's the long short of it. Like listening to Josh, especially talk about these games and where his background was and through the evolution or through the episodes that we've had together and just hear his story and what his takes were. It's now it's like, all of a sudden, I'm like much like you, he's a switch aficionado, man. Like anything, <laughs> anything that comes out, really, it's like, is it coming on the switch? Like those Nintendo independent games, possibly the, the greatest games. system ever made. Hey, yeah, that I mean, Mario game, though. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> um, anything else? Did you want to promote? Maybe do you have like a YouTube channel for your cinematography or anything? Uh, like that? I I do. Uh, I wasn't sure if I wanted to get to that point, but. Uh, my web- it is all it always it is always kind of harsh to sit and talk about movies and then be like and also I do stuff but uh, I hope you don't I hope you don't <laughs> hate it uh, but, but I mean I take my I am very critical of my own of my own work as well so as with most people nobody can hate us more than ourselves right I mean if anybody <laughs> wants to hear, if you want to have a talk with Lily she can tell you all about oh my, God. God, how <laughs> really self conscious about myself and so when I critique movies and especially movies it's like well what about what does he do and it's like what of his, what is his work and it's like uh, i'm, I'm just the microscope now so my uh my website is michaelsb.com but the business aim is sb video production um the reason why my website isn't as such is because um i get a lot of i do a lot of stuff on the side but really or the main comp- my main job is with working at a, at a mortgage company, and so I will put stuff up on my website as well, just to in- to showcase that I'm still practicing. I'm still I'm getting stuff out commercially as well, but it's not under SBVP. It's under my my birth name, basically. So that's why it's michaelsb.com. It's a mixture of both, but I am the sole proprietor owner of the company. So yeah, it's- and if anybody. Uh, is interested uh, the way I do know Espy is he's been the DP on several projects I've worked on and there's two films as of this recording 
again, I don't like dating these things because right, you fine. never know when it's going to come out. But right. uh, there's at least two films on my channel right now that he shot. They're great. They look awesome. Thanks, SP. You're welcome, man. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for having me. Like that's 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 always been a pleasure. Is the you know being the main guy and being in a way the main voice to some degree in happy that when the first one that we did uh, the mockingbird i when we shot it I'm like man this looks this feels really good looks really good and then in post production we did the coloring together we found that look and it it's not just not only the coloring but the way we shot it and what we wanted to go for it's like once everything was done on screen visually oh, i was like god really damn. good i mean <laughs> I mean, I was there for that film, and uh, it was my first experience. And let me tell you that it was it was pretty freaking great. <laughs> yeah, oh, it was. A, SB is a dream to work with. But uh, anything else? No, I think that's it, man. Thank you. So let me, let me say that just thank you for having on this episode, man. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, absolutely. It's I fun. get to talk about video games, which I almost never do. Which I'm not as much of a down that rabbit hole anymore these days although lately i have weirdly been i just bought uh i'm not i'm not there's no reason for me to go down this rabbit hole but okay yeah okay. That's uh, fine. <laughs> uh, how about you Liz? is there anything that you'd like to promote any personal stuff any causes that you're a crusader for oh man there's just so much i don't think it's enough time but um <laughs> if you guys want to check out my brother's web page uh, his facebook is chewy hernandez and um, he's a representative for Mway. So if you guys uh, are in need of some good stuff, hit him up. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Also, uh, I was I was not to really truly speak on your behalf, but uh, we are big proponents of uh, Matthew twenty five. So yes, we're gonna, we, we, awesome. if we're going to get down a serious route, a cause. Uh, she could do a better explanation of what Matthew twenty five is. Well, Matthew twenty five is actually a community. Um, medical service they offer health and dental services and it is basically for the less fortunate lower income people and they do some amazing work they they really do they they help out so many people in the community that it's it's just hard to go into everything they do but yeah if you guys are looking for a place to donate or or help out i would definitely recommend um to do so for matthew 25 that's awesome. Wow. Sure makes all our plugs seem very pale and self-centered in comparison, but right. <laughs> no, that's amazing. That's a great flood. Um, uh, yes, I think that's everything though, guys. So thank you all seven of you for tuning in to the show. Well, I really appreciate us. it. Love you. Uh, and I will catch you guys have probably never heard me do this outro yet. No, uh, it's horrible, but I did it on my first episode and I've stuck with it ever do since. It, it doesn't so, matter, man. You got to thanks do for it. tuning in and I will catch you guys on the flip flop later. <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs>